Well, hello, everyone. Uh, a very good night for those who are in uh, North America, like myself and Bob, and morning for those who are uh, appearing from India and from Pakistan. Today, we have a, a friend of us from India, uh, uh, Part Chohan, uh, who will be talking about the paleoanthropology of the Shivalik Hills. Uh, so, uh, I'm just giving, I'm just interested to give you a brief. Uh, 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 sort of uh, introduction about this series. Uh, obviously, it's an ongoing series of people who are joining, and uh, there are new people every time, depending on the interest they have in the in the in the talks. Uh, the series actually started probably more than two months ago, and this is uh, the thirteenth talk in that series. Uh, we are getting a lot of interest from across the world. Our friends from different countries are uh, attending the series. Uh, today we have uh, a colleague from uh, India, and Bob will be discussing uh, the, the, the speakers who are lined up for uh, future talks. Uh, so, Bob, I think now it's over to you, and you can uh, 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 introduce the speaker. Brad. Okay. Thank, thank you very much, Irfan, and uh, thank you, Muktiar, for coordinating. Uh, I'm just going to uh, briefly uh, mention some of our forthcoming programs. Uh, a week from tonight or from today, uh, Lisa Tauks uh, from the University of Santa Cruz will be giving a presentation on uh, magnetostratigraphy of the uh, Shawaliks with a particular emphasis on uh, chronology and timing the C3, C4 uh, isotopic transition. Following that, uh, in on the 2nd of June, uh, it'll be Peter Zeitler uh, from the uh, Lehigh University. And Peter will be talking about provenance issues in the uh, mineralogy in the Shualiks. And following that, uh, we've got uh, uh, Dr. Mona Lisa from the Qadi Azmi uh, University in Islamabad. And she'll be talking about seismic hazards and risks in the uh, uh, Shualik foothills of Pakistan. And then uh, we will be going on into uh, June and into July with uh, Turi Serling and uh, uh, Yanni Naiman and uh, I think uh, Mohammed Javed Khan will be giving a talk. So we've got a, a good series of speakers still coming, and we look forward to uh, welcoming you all in the in the future weeks. This this uh, today we have the wonderful opportunity to welcome uh, Parth Chohan uh, to the seminar series, and uh, he's coming to us from the Indian Institute of Science, Education, and Research, which is located in Chandigarh in India. And uh, Parth did his uh, undergraduate uh, uh, in archaeology and anthropology, uh, working at, at both Rutgers and also uh, at the Deccan College in India. And he received his PhD from the University of Sheffield in the UK. And he's been working for a considerable time looking at the uh, record of human uh, the human remains in the Shawalik rocks of the, of the Shawalik foothills, and he's established a series of international collaborations uh, to do this work. So uh, it's a great delight to, to welcome you, uh, Parth, and uh, we look forward very much to your presentation. And just in terms of the, the format, we'll probably have the, the talk will probably go for 45 to 50 minutes. And then we have what we call sort of a, 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 a slow close. If uh, people have questions and answers, we can stay a little bit longer and have some discussions. If people have to leave after an hour, we understand that. But if you'd like to stay, uh, we do have opportunities for questions and answers at the end of the program. So Parth, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Hello, everyone. My name is Park Johan. Uh, I'm an assistant professor of archaeology and paleoanthropology at Aysar Mohali. And the topic of my talk for this series is the paleoanthropology of the Shivalik Hills. Um, I'll be talking about uh, the introduction to prehistory first, so I can contextualize the evidence from the Shivaliks. And then I'll be talking about the various evidences reported from different time periods including uh, stone tools and associated eco ecological uh, attributes. 
Now, just to give a quick review of evolutionary milestones and how the Shuralic evidence and mainly the Indian subcontinent uh, has a role to play uh, in global human evolution uh, in paleontopology. So the earliest evidence of bipedalism at 7 million. Uh, then we have the earliest evidence of stone tools, 3.3 uh, million. And that's only from one site so far, uh, Lomekwi in Kenya. Uh, earliest evidence of butchery comes from the older one uh, sites. The earliest is 2.6 million. Our genus Homo appears at 2.8 million. <clears throat> All of this is based on current evidence. A lot of these might change uh, in the future. And based on evidence in, Af uh, in uh, China, we have the earliest evidence of dispersals. Haman is leaving Africa before 2.2 million because the Chinese sites are at least 2.2 uh, million years old. Then we have the next technology after Oldowan comes Acheulean and that appears around 1.8 million years ago. And then we have the oldest known evidence of fire from South uh, Southern Africa, 1.5 million years old. And these are just broad milestones uh, that have implications to understand uh, global dispersals and adaptations. Because once hominins start moving out, uh, there are separate uh, evolutionary trajectories. And then if you come to the middle Pleistocene, we have the middle Paleolithic emerging around half a million years ago. And interestingly, this is happening at different locations at the same time, instead of one single origin in Africa. Around 400 to 350,000 years ago, we have Neanderthals evolving in Europe, and also later on, the oldest human burials. Our species currently is uh, 315,000 years old, based on the fossil evidence uh, from Northern Africa. And then we have a uh, dispersal of our species. The first known one around 200,000 years ago, it possibly reaches Europe. Then it reaches the Levant 177,000 years ago, uh, possibly uh, reaching China 100,000 years ago, Eastern China. And then we have the oldest microliths appearing in Africa around 65,000 years ago. And after that, we have multiple dispersals of Homo sapiens into different regions, especially uh, Europe, Central Asia, Southern Asia, the Levant, many places. And then there's gradual replacement of Neanderthal populations. And there's also interbreeding. And between 50,000 and 25,000, Homo floresiensis in Southeast Asia become extinct. And Neanderthals also become extinct in Europe, Central Asia, Levant, and surrounding regions. Now, in terms of technology, uh, the reason it's called the Stone Age is because stone tools have survived. Uh, they were probably using other materials as well, such as wood, bone, antler, and other items. However, if you go by the oldest preserved evidence, it is stone tools. So 3.3 million, the earliest stone tool technology, Lomequian, for which there is no evidence of any dispersal. Then we have the beginning of the older one, around 2.6 million. And that is the first technology to leave Africa prior to 2.2 million, based on the Chinese evidence. And what is interesting is, uh, number one, at the moment, there is no archaeological evidence between 3.3 million and 2.6 million. And 2.6 million years onwards, the older one continues even after that Shulian is invented at 1.8 million. So there is parallel occurrences, independent sometimes, sometimes together at some sites. But the older one actually never uh, ends in a way because it's a very versatile and expedient technology that is part of all later technologies. Then we have the middle Paleolithic and then upper Paleolithic. Eventually, microlithic technology emerges in Africa and possibly spreads everywhere as well as might be having independent innovations. Now, once the earliest technologies leave Africa and become established, particularly early actually and onwards, we have independent origins of regional technologies across the old world. So we have multiple origins of the middle Paleolithic, 
we have possibly multiple origins of the upper paleolithic and eventually we might also have multiple origins of microlithic technology which eventually uh, it becomes part of the mesolithic phase now the paleontological relevance of south asia i wanted to highlight a few key points number one is geography and location if you see on this map it's located in the center of the old world geographically linking the records of africa europe and eastern and southeastern asia stone tools were discovered here roughly at the same time as in europe in the 1800s there's continuous uh, hominin occupation since at least 1.5 million or maybe even earlier and this region the entire subcontinent preserves stone tool technologies from all prehistoric phases meaning lower paleolithic middle paleolithic upper paleolithic and eventually mesolithic there were a number of animal species that are now extinct including hippos ostriches and others and the region preserves the Shirolic Hill sequence, a very well-known uh, sequence studied for many, many years by different scientists uh, from paleontological perspective, archeological perspective, geological perspective. Uh, so many new uh, discoveries have been made in Pakistan, India, and Nepal. However, uh, in terms of the human element or paleontology, most of the evidence is very uh, fragmented and not very well accepted or ambiguous. And I'll be covering uh, all of these key sites in the next few slides. Now, if you're looking at the uh, entire subcontinent based on known evidence, we have thousands of prehistoric sites. However, very few have been dated. So this map just shows some dated sites uh, across the subcontinent um, and includes sites dated earlier using both relative and absolute methods, as well as sites dated recently. So a lot of the older dates require uh, re-attempt, reinvestigations to confirm these ages. But one thing is clear that the oldest unambiguous date or non-contentious date is 1.5 million for the earliest Acheulean uh, in the subcontinent, which comes from Southern India. The older one is ambiguous, but younger technologies after Acheulean are very prominent and found everywhere. There's a lot of regional diversity uh, and the dates are now showing that there's a lot of technological overlap, chronological, spatial, geographic. There's overlap in various uh, locations of the subcontinent, as well as missing technologies in some regions. So based on compiled evidence, we have over 1,500 lower pelvic sites reported, over 700 middle pelvic sites reported, and over 500 upper pelvic sites reported. We need more absolute dates. The data is very random at the moment. We need to redate known sites as well as survey for new areas. And some of the earlier work, as I mentioned, requires verification, especially uranium thorium dates, argon argon dates. And there's also limitations with some dating methods. Uh, for example, luminescence uh, results are variable across the subcontinent. The Northern region compared to the Southern region, compared to the Central and Eastern and Western regions, uh, based on the quality of the uh, samples and exposure to sunlight, for example, in the past, the way the sediments were deposited, and of course, the way the archeological and paleontological materials are situated within these strata. There's also preservation and contextual issues. There's a lot of secondary deposition and disturbance. So we need to be careful about what we're dating and how we're dating it. One of the reasons behind lack of dates compared to other parts of the old world is because of lack of adequate funding and lack of dating labs. But now, uh, new labs have come up in the last few years. Uh, luminescence uh, dates have been pushed back. Uh, paleomagnetic dating can also be done. So basically relative dating and absolute dating can be combined to verify a lot of these ages. 
The oldest known hominin fossil comes from Hathnora, found in the 1980s in Narmada Valley, central India. Uh, unfortunately, it comes from a secondary deposit and the fossil itself is incomplete, so not diagnostic to assign it a species, uh, specific species name. All you know is that it is a female, it is not homo sapiens, uh, and it comes from a secondary deposit with a minimum age of 48,000. Of course, the fossil itself could be much older and is probably much older. It might be about half a million years old or even a million years old. It's not very clear. Uh, but the archaeology associated with this uh, fossil includes lower Paleolithic and middle Paleolithic elements. So that is also not very diagnostic in terms of assigning an age. But we do know that uh, this area has a potential for yielding more fossils in the future. So some broad issues for South Asia. Did older one hominins reach the Indian subcontinent? And this is where the Shivalik Hills come in. How many Acheulean dispersals were there into and out of the Indian subcontinent? Did hominins slash technologies disperse to Central and Southeast Asia from the subcontinent? This is very unclear at the moment. What are the timings and nature of technological transitions? What is the age and nature of symbolic behavior? How did hominins adapt to the subcontinent's ecological and climatic diversity, especially the prominent monsoon pattern, which is biannual, and at least 18 million years old? And finally, were humans responsible for any animal extinctions? And if they were, to what degree? For example, hippos become extinct. Some uh, species of cattle, horse also become extinct and ostriches. So it's possible that uh, climate played a major role for some species while humans played a major role for other species. And this needs to be worked out through long-term research. Now, looking at a historical perspective of prehistoric or Paleolithic investigations in the Shivalik Hills, we have Pakistan, India, and Nepal. Very little work has been done in Nepal and pioneering work has mostly been done by Joshi and Corvinus. Beyond that, we have very little evidence of prehistoric sites from there. Most of the work in the Shivalik comes from Pakistan and India. Numerous researchers have worked in these regions, especially after the systematic work of Deterra and Patterson in 1930s. All of these sites have been reported from various uh, uh, Shivalik locations and on surfaces of various Shivalik formations. And some of this work is ongoing. Now, if you're looking at uh, the distribution of prehistoric sites in the Shivaliks, they can be broadly divided into Acheulean sites and Sohanian sites. And as you can see here, based on the color coding, they're found everywhere. However, some occurrences represent fine spots and some occurrences represent rich factory sites. Most of them are in surface context, but a few are stratified. However, absolute dates are lacking uh, at the moment. So we have various technologies represented uh, in, the, in the region, although some technologies are either ambiguous or completely missing. For example, we don't know if there's a distinct uh, Oldowan technology or Oldowan uh, occupation in the region. We don't know if there's any upper Paleolithic assemblages that are independent from middle Paleolithic and uh, younger technologies. So far, no clear evidence of proper Mesolithic has been found. And all of this may be due to uh, population movements, lack of raw material, uh, subsistence patterns based on eco ecology, and various other factors that need to be explored. The way the sites are forming, especially the older ones, and how they're uh, being exposed today this diagram shows the process. So we have uh, a hypothetical situation where we have human occupation when the upper Shivalik formations were being uh, formed, when those deposits were uh, getting distributed on the landscape through fluvial processes and other processes. So if hypothetically, uh, if we consider that there was only one occupation in, in the Pinjor times, uh, that shows the initial uh, pattern on top. 
And then we have these interface sites. When further deposition takes place and hominid occupation continues, and this is prior to uplift, right before upliftment. And then following upliftment, when the deposition stops, we have a lot of post sites. So we have different types of paleontological sites found in different contexts, partly because of earlier depositional patterns, but also because of post-depositional processes, including weathering, uh, erosion, and upliftment. So there's a lot of secondary deposition of older material. And this needs to be worked out, distinguished, and dated. We also have evidence of human occupation in the Dune Valleys, in Nepal, as well as India. And most of that evidence is post -shualic. We have a lot of displacement of, of uh, stone tools. Um, and this is mostly due to upliftment, followed by various erosional processes. So earlier, these shivalic surfaces prior to upliftment, uh, they were at a different height. And as these uh, strata and land surfaces uh, became uplifted, a lot of these artifacts and other materials uh, basically got displaced. So now what we're finding today might not be the original occupational surface or the occupational height uh, as known in the past. And this needs to be investigated. Which sites uh, have been uh, extremely disturbed? Which sites are more or less intact? Because it's possible that a lot of the uh, occurrences have simply been uplifted. So they might be datable, but the ancient land formation and elevation have changed. So this process of upliftment, erosion, displacement is resulting in an interesting pattern where we have young technologies mixed with older shivalic fossils. So the shivalic fossils are predominantly coming from the shivalic sediments but the stone tools are mostly coming from post contexts. So there's a mixing of the two and it can be misleading because it might look like a, a butchery site where, where actually it is not. So we have stone tools here uh, on shivalic surfaces combined with vertebrate fossils. Now what we need to do is separate the two, separate secondary and mixed occurrences like this from potential primary occurrences. We might have sites in the Pinjo Formation where the fossils and stone tools are contemporary and associated with each other, but we need to excavate and prove it contextually, spatially, and geochronologically. This shows uh, how sites are forming. Uh, so we have uh, number one, showing horizontal bedding during Tatar times when there's no human occupation. And then later on, when everything is uplifted and dissected, we have human occupation happening in the upper Pleistocene or late Pleistocene. Theoretical perspective based on uh, research in the Shivalic frontal zone. So the yellow sediments are the floodplain deposits, the red dots represent artifacts, and the black dots represent quartzite class available for stone tool making. And then these kind of occurrences were further uplifted and dissected and the artifacts were distributed throughout the landscape and occurring at various elevations, including top of the uh, shivalic sediments, as well as uh, at the bottom in modern seasonal channels and other uh, uh, comparable locations. We also have fine spots occurring in fine grain sediments. Uh, this could be misleading. It's not necessary that there are actually primary context fine spots or in situ occurrences. It's possible that a lot of these artifacts uh, were actually on top of the shivalic surfaces in the past. And then because of upliftment, erosion, uh, monsoon processes and gully formation, uh, they slid down and became embedded in fine grain context. So it could be misleading. Just because they're embedded in fine grain context doesn't mean they're in primary context. So we need to find these occurrences in high numbers and in excavations to prove that they're truly primary 
versus secondary. Here we have a close up of the same. And sometimes the artifact might be fresh, sometimes it might be abraded. Now, coming back to dispersals, the earliest evidence outside of Africa is 2.2 million in Eastern Asia, followed by Dalmanisi, about 1.8 million in Europe, and then followed by Southeast Asia. All of this evidence is represented by stone tools or hominin fossils. In the case of Dalmanisi, both are preserved. And as you can see, the Indian subcontinent has a major role to play in understanding these dispersals. It could have been a corridor during these movements. And I would like to point out that we should also consider multi-directional movements. It's possible that hominins moved across uh, Central Asia and then entered the Indian subcontinent from Northeast India. So we, look, we should look at movement from East to West, not just West to East. And the Southeast Asian hominins, we don't know if they went through India or through Central Asia and then South. The Shirelic zone, based on fossils, pollen evidence, geochemistry, sedimentology, and various other evidences, suggests that it was ecologically conducive for human occupation. We have diverse habitats represented in the region, especially both Tatrat and Pinjar formations. Like for example, in this reconstruction, we have bushland, grassland, sandy plains, seasonal pools, and hilly regions. So there's definitely a very conducive uh, environment for human occupation in the upper Shivaliks. This is also reflected in the vertebrate faunal record. So comparing faunal lists of mammals uh, and other animals from Dalmanisi, Ubadia in Israel, Sangiran in Southeast Asia, in the Pinjar formation in general, we have overlap of some species and suggesting uh, overlap in ecology and habitats. Now, Dalmanisi, Ubadia, and Sangaran have all yielded hominin fossils, but the Pinjo formation has yet to yield anything diagnostic uh, and substantial. So here we have uh, different uh, fauna suggesting ecological overlap. We have predators, we have browsers, grazers, and other animals. So there's evidence of uh, patches of grasslands, forest environments, so diverse habitats. Elephants as well. So you can see the color coding shows uh, links, ecological links between all these regions. So ecologically, it shows that there was possibly human occupation. In other words, there was no re reason to avoid this area. Hominin occupation would have taken place if they had reached this area during the earliest occupations. They would not have bypassed it. But then we have to think about other factors for the lack of occupation. In the future, if we find uh, that there is no clear evidence, if all these areas have been properly surveyed after several decades and we don't find any evidence of human occupation, we need to offer alternate hypotheses and, and give reasons why there was no occupation. One could be the lack of raw material uh, or other factors, the lack of preservation of sites. Now, what is the evidence for Oldowan in South Asia? The earliest dispersal from Africa. We have sites reported from the Shivaliks in the North and some sites in Central India. Unfortunately, all of these sites are not uh, well studied. They're not accepted uh, because they don't come from excavated context and most of them are not dated. So as you can see, this table shows these sites, uh, summarizes them in terms of their age, their context, the problems, uh, and what has been reported. 
so various types of technologies have been reported, including Acheulean, pre-Acheulean. Uh, the main uh, problem uh, with these sites includes uh, low artifact quantities, lack of excavated contexts, dubious in-situ stratigraphic contexts, indirect dating or no dating, and whatever hominin fossils have been reported, they're very ambiguous or non-diagnostic. So in short, no unequivocal pre acheulean or older one site is known in South Asia yet, entire subcontinent. And this is very surprising considering how long research has been taking place in the region. So one reason for this is lack of uh, focused surveys and also the lack of extensive early Pleistocene context. When I say lack, I mean either they've not been recognized or they're deeply buried uh, or they've not been uh, surveyed. And I'm talking about uh, central and peninsular India. The early Pleistocene evidence or landscapes are most abundant in the Shivalik zone, but beyond the Shivalik zone to the south, the subcontinent has very few pockets of early Pleistocene sediments, known pockets. So we need to locate more such context to identify all the one occupation. But considering that the Shivaliks uh, are spread or located at the entry point of the subcontinent, they have a potential of uh, uh, yielding the earliest evidence. So as Oldowan sites have been well excavated and well dated in other locations such as Africa, Europe, China, no such excavations have yet taken place in the subcontinent. The best known evidence was reported by the British Archaeological Mission to Pakistan in the 1980s and include Rewat and Pabi Hills. And these two sites come from the Shivalik Hills of Pakistan. The problem with Rivat is that the collections were meager and situated in a gravel context. So a secondary deposition. And the date and artifacts remain equivocal. Until we have excavations in fine grain context with well-preserved stone tools and possibly also animal fossils, we cannot be sure of human occupation. However, Rewat does suggest possible presence of humans two million years ago. Then we have the Pabi Hills evidence where the collection is richer, comes from fine grain context, and also, also associated with faunal evidence, but is spread across a huge landscape and all of it is in surface context. So the investigators did not find uh, high densities of, of occurrences of stone tools. And none of these occurrences come from excavations or test trenches. They all come from surface context. But at the same time, no younger technologies were found in this landscape. So in a way, the Poppy Hills material, which is between 2 million and 1 million, seems to be more convincing as older one technology than the Rewat evidence. But more research is required in all of these places, including the Pakistan Shivaliks, Indian Shivaliks, and the Nepal Shivaliks. Then we have 2.6 million year old cut marks reported from uh, near Chandigarh recently. But the problem is, again, we have uh, this specimen occurring in surface context, not an association with the stone tools in the same strata. And it's not clear if the cut marks were made by humans in the past or made by other processes. It could have been made by uh, predator teeth, abrasion through fluvial transport, maybe even trampling. It's not clear. It is also possible that these are actually cut marks made by hominins, maybe 2.6 million years old. But we need to find more supporting evidence. Uh, this is still remains ambiguous because of its context, because of uh, lack of stratigraphic association with stone tools in excavations and for other reasons. So still we have uh, a mixture happening of uh, young artifacts with older fossils. 
And we need to make sure we're finding contemporary evidence. So it is possible that there, were, there was human occupation at 2.6 million uh, in the Shivaliks, but it's not clear. Uh, also, it's not clear which species was represented. Was it early homo? Was it something else? Did these populations continue eastwards? Did they continue south into the uh, into peninsular India, for example? Are there other sites like this out there? So while the Masol evidence is controversial and ambiguous, it does raise uh, questions and potential of the region uh, for finding new sites. So the region, uh, the Shivalik Hills uh, in general, deserves more uh, attention from different perspectives by archeologists, vertebrate paleontologists, physical anthropologists, and others. Now, one reason for the low number of sites in the Pinjaro Formation might be because we have variable availability of raw materials in the past. The Pinjaro Formation landscape has very little uh, occurrences of rocks. So if rocks were scarce, then we would have very low signatures uh, of uh, archeological occurrences. That might explain why we're not finding rich sites as other parts of India, because the raw material sources were rare or scarce. So we're looking at availability of raw material, it was variable in time and space. Once the boulder kilometer formation starts to become uh, available, then we have an increase in sites. But again, the timing of the boulder kilometer formation is variable across the Shivalik landscape. In Pakistan and India, it has different ages. And gradually, the secondary deposits of the boulder kilometer formation form the post Shivalik gravels. A lot of sites are associated with these post Shivalik gravels. So it certainly shows an increase of human occupation. Once the Bolo Kangamar formation is distributed on the landscape. However, we don't know if this association is continuous or intermittent. We also don't know the age, the earliest age of this uh, occurrence. So we have a lot of ambiguous or non-diagnostic stone tool sites associated with uh, boulder conglomerate formation and post shivalik gravels, but we don't know how they can be classified, whether they're lower Paleolithic or middle Paleolithic or younger. They could even be of Mesolithic uh, and uh, protohistoric age, but they resemble Paleolithic occurrences. Then we also have unique taphonomic patterns, possibly hinting at why hominin fossils are not found. From a study uh, in Pakistan, researchers found that uh, small to medium mammals, small to medium sized mammals are rare and very large mammals are rare. However, medium to large sized mammals are common. So based on taphonomic patterns in the Pabi Hills, it may explain why homo, sapien, homo, homo uh, species fossils are largely absent. We also need to think about how younger age fossils might be found in the landscape because the behavior of early hominins and the behavior of younger hominins will be different. So we would expect different patterns of fossil preservation and their location on the landscape. For example, the younger uh, hominins might have been adapted to cave sites or rock shelter sites. The older hominins would have preferred more uh, open air locations. So we need to look at not just in the Shivalik zone itself, in the Shivalik zone proper, but also on the periphery zones, especially uh, towards the lesser Himalaya. It's possible that uh, habitation was taking place immediately outside the Shivalik zone, but land use was happening everywhere for subsistence, hunting, 
foraging. So we need to look at uh, the role that the Shivalik landscape played in a different way, not just in terms of hominin occupation and fossil preservation. And this taphonomic pattern would be applicable at individual locations. It should not be viewed as being applicable across the entire Shivalik zone. So the two traditions that we have are basically Ashulian and Sohanian or hand axes, cleavers as part of the Ashulian and then uh, choppers and flake blade based assemblages in the Sohanian, Co mostly core tools made on rounded raw materials. And all of these sites have been reported from Pakistan, India, and Nepal. Although some researchers have not classified these occurrences as Sohanian, some of them resemble Sohanian, but it's not a separate uh, cultural entity as initially proposed by Deterrent Patterson. Now we know that the Sohanian represents uh, adaptations to rounded raw materials across time and space. But we still don't know the relationship of the earliest Sohanian evidence and the Ashulian evidence. And also the relationship between potential Oldowan evidence and later Sohanian evidence. But sites are found throughout the landscape in different contexts. Now just to show you some photographs of uh, specimens from different locations. Here we have uh, Ashulian artifacts from Solon Valley in Pakistan. Then we have Ashulian artifacts from Atbarapur in India. And most of these occurrences are all coming from surface context or uh, as fine spots, but mostly in low numbers. I would say that the Sohanian assemblages are richer in comparison, but the Ashulian occurrences are not as rich. And the sites are also low in number. Here we have uh, the Satpati Hill site in Nepal. As you can see, a fine spot of one hand axe, possibly representing uh, human occupation prior to upliftment of the landscape. Now, one reason for the low profile of Ashulian sites and the low number of bifaces in the Shivaliks could be uh, related to raw material because most of the raw material is rounded in nature. It is more challenging to make bifaces, large bifaces from this material. Boulders are rare, especially quartzite boulders. Most of the material or class in the boulder conglomerate formation uh, is represented by large cobbles and pebbles. And majority of them are too small to make large bifaces. One needs to extract large flake blanks, as you can see in this diagram, to make large bifaces. So large flakes from boulders or reduce large cobbles and retain some of the cortex in the center. Even though uh, the bifaces so far that have been reported in the Shivaliks are well-made and they're typical to bifaces found in other parts of the subcontinent, it is not clear always whether all of these occurrences represent regional production or a combination of regional production and transport from outside regions. Here we have a comparison of Shivalik uh, rounded class on the right compared to angular limestone uh, class from Southern India. So you can see that rounded raw materials offer less opportunities for extraction of large flakes unless they're split or thrown on an anvil or broken fragments are found. Whereas this, this blocky material has angles which allows initiation of lake extraction or blank extraction. We do have some misleading uh, specimens in the Shivaliks. They resemble hand axes. Unfortunately, these are actually unifaces and not bifaces. So maybe we have 
variable types of uh, hand axes or hand axe like specimens in the region based on raw material constraints. We also need to keep in mind that it's possible that the Shivalik zone preserves uh, the same population making different technologies at some points in time and at some locations. For example, this paper from uh, this research from Africa in uh, Ethiopia suggests that there was co occurrence of Acheulean assemblages and Olduan assemblages on the same landscapes. At two different times, 1.26 million years ago and about 1.6 million years ago, we have co occurrence of these technologies on the landscape. So in a similar manner, we could have had co-occurrences of Soinian-like or mode one and Acheulean-like or mode two technologies on the Shivalik landscape. We need to think about variability instead of dichotomies. As I said, all of these sites are found in different contexts, uh, geographic context, sedimentary context, stratigraphic context, they're found in uh, upper Shivalik sediments, even older sediments on Shivalik hill slopes in their frontal zone, uh, in the interior zones, in dune valleys, on large river terraces such as Markanda, Gagar, so on. And a lot of the sites are also associated with post Shivalik lust deposits, especially in Pakistan and Kashmir. And when we compare Sohanian and Australian assemblages, we have again variations in artifact densities, the types of tools present, and the nature of raw material exploitation. And this needs to be worked out through more interdisciplinary research to find out the actual chronological, technological, cultural, and other relationships between the two entities. How much overlap there is, how much independent occurrences there are, and uh, what are the ages of all these occurrences? The earliest evidence was proposed by Deterrent Patterson, where they noticed or, or proposed a technological progression within the Sohanian based on terror sequences of the Sohan River. They found variations of uh, technologies within the Sohanian, uh, such as early Sohan A, early Sohan B, and so on and so forth. And these are correlated to different. Uh, glacial and interglacial cycles. But later on, it was refuted by the British Archaeological Mission to Pakistan. Here we have some specimens as reported by uh, the Turin Patterson and Patterson and Drummond. Various types of uh, choppers, core scrapers, uh, hand axe like specimens, Lavalwa like specimens and others, a mixture of technologies and typologies. Here we have artifacts, Soinian artifacts from uh, Gilakalan, also Soinian artifacts from Toka in India. Gilakalan is in Pakistan. So there's definitely some broad uh, overlap, typological overlap between Soinian assemblages or Soinian-like assemblages in Pakistan, India, and Nepal. But they're probably all different ages and maybe even made by different uh, species. We need to consider that fact. Even younger assemblages uh, could have been made by, uh, for example, Neanderthals, which I'll talk about at the end of the presentation. Then we have uh, Lavalwa-like or atypical Lavalwa specimens, which means they're made on prepared core uh, specimens, but they lack the preparation on the platform. They don't have faceted platforms, but they do have multiple dorsal scars. We have a range of choppers now being found at some sites. So uh, they're reducing them to different degrees, sometimes up to the margin, sometimes across the entire face. We also have bifacial choppers, uh, but they're very different from the bifaces found in the actual end. We don't have any uh, shaping or symmetry or refinement. They're very uh, 
homogeneous in terms of the overall size, but they're very diverse in terms of their typology. When we look at uh, end choppers versus side choppers, there's definitely um, differences. If you look at this, uh, this graph here for end choppers and then look at the graph for side choppers, there's definitely variations in terms of selection of raw materials. The side choppers in their average dimensions of length, breadth, and thickness are homogeneous. These dimensions overlap. But if you look at the top diagram, you can see more variability within the end choppers. It means that the original class chosen for end choppers were more amorphous and more diverse in their shape and size compared to side choppers. So they were selecting the same shape and size for side choppers. And later research, uh, for example, by Lysette, uh, looked at some of the cores collected by Deterrent Patterson and found out that some of them do contain a mode three or middle Paleolithic element. So it proved for the first time that Sohanian elements or Sohanian assemblages could be younger as well. They don't necessarily have to be all lower Paleolithic. And now we know that Sohanian tool types also occur at some Harappan sites in uh, India. So basically rounded raw materials in the Shivalix were used all the way from possibly early Pleistocene into the Holocene because of this versatility. The sites from Nepal, Arjun 3, very distinct uh, laminar technologies, paired core technologies, as well as other assemblages. This is a middle pillar site studied by Corvinus. So if you summarize the Sohanian, now we know that it's not a separate entity, but it could overlap, partly overlap with Ashulian, but also it continues across time and space. We don't have any evidence that it was independent culture, just like we have Ashulian technology, uh, which is distinct characters. So Indian is very ambiguous. It has variable characters and each assemblage is different in Pakistan, India, and Nepal. The age is unclear. The majority appears to be post Ashulian in age, although there might be some overlap. And now we're finding uh, some occurrences that are summary, primary in context. So far, we have no evidence of technological change within the Soanian because no sites have been dated. But if you look at a broad level, assuming that they start at the beginning of the boulder kilometer formation and then end in the Holocene, there seems to be uh, definitely uh, change in the use of landscapes and change in assemblage compositions over time. But whether there's a regional technological progression and spread across the entire Shivalik zone is not clear. We have one site, Site 55 in Pakistan, uh, which is dominated by laminar technology. It's dated to 45,000 years ago. And it comes from less context. Now this is, the only known site in the region which resembles upper periodic assemblages. Here we have similar uh, elements, laminar elements or blade-like elements from a site in India, Toka. So these elements are found variably in different assemblages across the landscape, but we don't know if uh, they represented a specific uh, uh, technology within a specific time frame, like a like a upper periodic phase, for example. Some sites have yielded uh, microliths, like this occurrence in Nepal. But if you look at it from broad level, microliths are more or less absent uh, or very very marginal in the Shivalik zone and in the Himalayan zone. More research is required actually to pinpoint uh, the distribution of microliths. 
Then we have younger artifacts uh, getting into the Neolithic. So we need to keep in mind that some of the younger artifacts like Neolithic age, Mesolithic age might resemble Paleolithic artifacts. We also have to keep in mind that these younger populations could have recycled older artifacts because the raw material was rare in some locations. They could have recycled uh, Paleolithic specimens and reflaked them and reshaped them and then discarded them. We're also finding evidence of stone tools in association with pottery, such as this occurrence near Nangal. Excavations here uh, showed that um, there was a mixture, stratigraphic association and mixture of pottery and stone tools. So stone tools continue being used into the Holocene. And as I said earlier, they're even found uh, at some Harappan sites in the region. And finally, coming to dispersals, we have possible evidence that the Shoalic zone was used as a corridor of movement from west to east and maybe even from east to west. It's not clear uh, how much movement there was. And also movement from Shoalic zone to central India and vice versa. From where did hominins enter? In which direction did they move? In which direction did technologies disperse? All this is unclear. So we definitely have an ecological dichotomy between uh, the Shwalik zone in uh, Pakistan and India compared to Southeast Asia and Northeast India. So we have uh, the lack of lower Paleolithic occurrences in Northeast India. So it's not clear if Northeastern zone was used as a corridor by fauna and humans. It's a very different ecology. So we have occurrences of grasslands uh, and forest environments in uh, very flat landscapes prior to the upliftment of the Shivaliks. But in Northeast India, we have a very hilly region, uh, rugged, uh, very wet and humid, and also very thick vegetation. So it would have accommodated a different type of uh, faunal uh, community. So whatever uh, the hominins were hunting in uh, the Shivaliks of India and Pakistan and the rest of the uh, central and peninsular India, that kind of setup would have been different in Northeast India. So at the moment, we don't know if early hominins occupied Northeast India. Uh, it's possible that uh, later on, prehistoric Homo sapiens uh, passed through and occupied these zones because they are more adapted to diverse environments. We do have possible uh, evidences of faunal connections between Southeast Asia and Shualix. But again, how did they disperse there? When did they disperse? Were humans associated with these faunal movements? Everything is very unclear. And of course, Southeast Asia has a role to play in understanding uh, evolution through isolation as well. Once these areas were submerged due to rising sea levels. So Northeast India, as I said, no convincing Paleolithic evidence. Everything is very young, like terminal Pleistocene onwards, and majority is dominated by Holocene age Neolithic evidence. So, so far, the Shivaliks of uh, Northeast India have not yielded any early evidence as we know from other parts like Nepal, uh, Northwest India and Pakistan. So it remains uh, ambiguous, the role of Northeast India in providing evidence for a possible geographic link between the Southeast Asian Homo erectus sites and the sites to the West of India. So we don't know if the Shualik zone was used as a corridor until we find that evidence. Now, if uh, the Northeast Indian zone, the Shualiks in uh, east, Eastern Nepal and, and eastwards, if they're very rugged, full of vegetation and uh, humid environments, then looking for preserved sites would also be a challenge. It might be that sites are deeply buried 
or not very easily visible because of vegetation and the rugged landscape, not necessarily that the hominins were absent. So we need to find out if, uh, first of all, how we can actually locate these sites logistically, find out if there's a true absence of human occupation or is it an absence of preservation? Here are some examples of Neolithic artifacts from Northeast India, including pottery. So I'm just showing you different types of prehistoric sites across the Shivalik zones and surrounding areas to show you the diversity of uh, technologies across time and space. So we have a lack of prehistoric evidences um, in various parts of the subcontinent. For example, lower paleolithic evidence has not been reported from southern India, extreme southern India, and Sri Lanka. Now, if you're looking at the lack of dispersals from India to Southeast Asia, we have these geographic, uh, basically, uh, features that act as barriers. The Tibetan Plateau, the Himalayan Zone, the Ganga Plains, and then the hilly, wet tropical forest of Northeast India and surrounding zones like uh, Burma, Laos, Thailand, especially. Now, the Ganga Plains might've been a barrier because again, the lack of stone. And then we have the Brahmaputra Delta as well. Very difficult to cross maybe in early Pleistocene times, if it was there. And the Himalaya, probably not crossed until uh, late middle Pleistocene times when hominins were more adapted to high altitudes. So because of these barriers, it's possible that uh, certain technologies and certain populations did not continue eastwards from India. So maybe uh, they used the Shivaliks as a corridor up to Nepal, but did not continue eastwards. And the evidence from Nepal is mostly connected with evidence from Southeast Asia, but at a very young age. From terminal Pleistocene onwards, we have these connections, not, not older ones. So whether India was a cultural cul-de-sac or a corridor, when we look at uh, movements towards Southeast Asia is not clear. So far, there's no evidence actually in dispersals eastwards. The Ashulian kind of ends in uh, West Bengal, area. We have no evidence of middle Pilotic eastwards. No such evidence has been found in uh, the Northeast Indian Shivaliks or surrounding zones. And connections with Southeast Asia along the coastal route are very young as well, with Australia, for example. Now, recent uh, discoveries in Tibet suggest that there may have been uh, Denisovan populations in the Himalaya. We need to keep this in mind that if they were well adapted to high altitude environments, they could have moved towards the Himalaya and surrounding zones, including the Shivalik ranges. This could have been during upliftment and following upliftment of the Shivalik zone. So we have Denisovan populations moving around the landscape. Uh, in Asia at this time. And also later on, uh, Homo sapiens uh, comes in from various locations. We have multiple dispersals of Homo sapiens. We're still trying to pinpoint the earliest evidence in South Asia, but we do know that they possibly reached China at about 100,000 years ago. So we need to keep all of this in mind in relation to changing landscapes and ecologies in the Shivalik zone. And some researchers, have also suggested, based on stone tool typology, the presence of Neanderthals in Pakistan. So we have Denisovans in the Tibetan Plateau. We have possibly Neanderthals in parts of Pakistan. So that means the Shualik zone may have accommodated multiple species over time, including Homo erectus or Habilis in the beginning, followed by uh, Neanderthals and Denisovans, and eventually followed by Homo sapiens. So we need to find out if Himalayan zones preserves uh, 
fossil evidence of these species. We need to look within the Shivalik zone as well as beyond the Shivalik zone to understand occupation of, uh, by humans of this landscape. So in conclusion, more than 100 Paleolithic sites have been reported from the Shivalik Himalayan region. The earliest dated Paleolithic evidence comes from Riwat and Pabi Hills and Masol. But all of this needs to be uh, better demonstrated through new research, new sites, uh, especially excavations in fine grain context and better dating. The evidence broadly suggests occupation by different hominid species over time, as I've just mentioned. But again, we need fossil evidence to prove this. And it's possible that uh, hominid occupation was not continuous in the Shivalik zone. Maybe it was intermittent. Hominid populations could have uh, moved in and out of the region over time instead of continuously occupy, occupying the ecozone. Most of the Paleolithic evidence is dominated by undated uh, and ambiguous Soanian assemblages, which are of variable ages. And the age of the Ashulian still needs to be worked out. Uh, there's a debate whether it's part of the, part of the Shivalik sediments or whether it's post-Shivalik in age. It's not clear. Uh, some of the Nepal evidence is younger. So it's post-Shivalik in age, comes from the Dun Valleys. But some of the Indian evidence seems to be older. So it's not clear if all of this Ashulian evidence is contemporary or uh, different ages. And some of it might also belong to uh, early Middle Paleolithic. In the Northeast Indian zone, including the Shivaliks in Northeastern India, is dominated by Neolithic evidence. No convincing uh, Paleolithic evidence is found yet. I would like to thank the organizers of this series and my colleagues and mentors and students, as well as Aysar Mahali and Government of India for permission to do research at various locations. Thank you for your attention and I look forward to uh, your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Chohan. We, we some, somehow had a problem on this side. I don't know if that was the case with everyone. I'm just not sure. But, uh, we understand the technical issue that comes along sometimes. So if there's any question, uh, you can raise your hands and I'll just like to entertain. Uh, uh, I mean, hello, can you hear me? <laughs> Yes, yes, we, we are hearing you. Am I, am I heard? Okay, okay. Well, um, I'll, I'll start with, with a question. Uh, it's an extremely interesting presentation, uh, Parth, and, and one of the things that seems to be very clear is the, the, the cha there's a big challenge in terms of finding material in situ, meaning uh, to find the artifacts actually preserved in the in the geological context because it appears that many of your situations as you illustrated are uh, hybrid zones of, of multiple land surfaces and do you have situations in the Shuwalik Hills where you've made uh, large excavations where you've dug into the rocks to try to find material in situ uh, that's a good question. So what we're doing now is uh, we're focusing on using different methods to recover primary context evidence. Now, it, it, we have to use different strategies depending on the chronological uh, targets. If we're looking for early Pleistocene evidence, uh, we're focusing only on Pindra formation. But if we're looking for post shuwalik evidence, we're looking at uh, the Dun Valleys, for example, the frontal zones. So we're using different... Uh, uh, geological context to target different assemblages. Now, the problem with the Pinjo formation and other other uh, uh, landscapes in the Shivaliks is that we might uh, finding uh, the, the chances of uh, 
primary context assemblages uh, is high, but the, the chances of them staying primary context is low because the, the landscape is very dynamic because of constant rainfall and erosion and then human activity. Even if something erodes out, it might not stay in its original position for long. So now uh, we're, not, we're not focusing too much on uh, targeting the stone tools because those are mostly post trialic in age, but we're now targeting uh, the faunal assemblages because those are definitely early Pleistocene in age. They cannot be post trialic in age because the fossilization process stops once the boulder conglomerate uh, is deposited. So we have a better chance of finding early Pleistocene evidence uh, if you target the fossils. And, and do you have situations, uh, Parth, where you're able to uh, find bone beds or concentrations of fossils that warrant excavation? Uh, this is a good question again. Now, I'm just wondering because uh, my student is working on this aspect uh, of locating early Pleistocene material. Uh, and she basically is finding a pattern where uh, the fossils are still not abundant. They're not high density. Uh, I don't know whether that's because a lot of the older material has been collected already or whether uh, this stuff has been redeposited and buried, for example, or whether it is destroyed or uh, there's a pattern where only pockets of the Shivalix has rich assemblages. We're not finding any bone beds. We're finding mostly isolated fine spots uh, scattered across the landscape. Uh, I think the highest amount of fossils we found at one location are about two dozen, and all of it is fragmentary. We're not finding complete elements uh, compared to the earlier sites as reported from Pakistan and India. Mm. So okay, we, we have a, we... we have Catherine. Catherine, can you want to question? Good morning, and thank you for an interesting talk. Uh, do you have any uh, evidence of uh, effects of the uh, stone tools on the actual, on other mammal fossils uh, during the time periods when you have uh, a stone tool assemblages recorded? In other words, distinctive patterns of bone breakage, cut marks, and that sort of thing. Yeah, so we're just uh, beginning to look at that. Uh, so we're looking at two data sets. One is getting new fossils from the field and then analyzing those for cut marks, which has not been done systematically before. And the second is going back to the older historical collections in the museums and the universities and looking for various cut marks on them. So then we're going to try to get a pattern to see if uh, those cut marks are located on specific uh, locations on the bones, for example, uh, or in a specific uh, configuration. And then we're going to see if they represent uh, maybe trampling or uh, predator teeth marks, for example, uh, or genuine cut marks. So at the moment, except for Masol, reported by the French uh, Indian team, we have nothing uh, else. So uh, we have Faramjit. Uh, now, uh, Faramjit, now you can uh, unmute yourself and ask the question. Uh, Dr. Sir, part one, uh, uh, the talk is very interesting, uh, but the, the problem is uh, mics, uh, uh, the sound is not clear. But uh, it, uh, by the way, it's okay, but I have uh, some doubt about the evolution of uh, humans. As we know, sir, the humans were involved from as like Australopithecus. Uh, in 1974, in Africa, uh, Dr. Donald Johansson discovered a hominid uh, and known as the Lucy. Uh, so my question is, is Lucy an elf or uh, human? And uh, will it be the direct ancestor of archaic or archaic and uh, the modern uh, human? And the last question is, uh, uh, so what kind of dating method did that you use uh, for dating the jungle sites like Narmada and other upper Swalik sites in India. Okay, hi Pimjit, nice to see you. Uh, uh, nice to see. So uh, to answer your first question uh, mm. about Lucy, now I'm mm. sure the particular references, uh, a lot of research has been done on that specific specimen in the last few decades. Now what they're finding out is it was actually human or you can say hominin, was walking oh. on two legs, 
but he was uh, still behaving like an ape. Okay. So it had it had the capability of climbing trees. It was still bipedal also and arboreal as well. It had mixed traits. So morphological traits and behavioral traits, it was mixed. It was still in the process of becoming completely uh, hominin. Oh. But we have now uh, other evidences where people have found new species and new fossils suggesting that uh, Australopithecus afarensis was not a direct ancestor. Okay. So there's a debate. Some say it was a direct ancestor, some say it wasn't. So it's not clear because we have a lot of fossil gaps in between. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what, uh, about, so what about the dating method? Uh, is the OSL dating is parallel? Yeah, so each and every site we have to use different methods depending on the age estimated and depending on the material preserved. Uh, for the younger sites now, uh, the OSL method is going back, uh, is extending sites to like almost half a million now. And if you use IRSL, infrared luminescence dating, we're going up to 1 million or beyond 1 million. But if you have, if you have fauna, for example, or if you have volcanic ash, I prefer to use other methods. For example, argon, argon, or we can use ESR, uh, we can use biochronology, uh, paleomag. We're going we're gonna to have to use multiple methods to get these uh, ages uh, correct. Uh, we cannot use one single method. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a question from uh, Professor Gary. Uh, please unmute yourself. Yes, thank you very much. This was quite interesting. Uh, I'm, I'm probably dating myself, but uh, I recall decades ago reading a general uh, summary of uh, tool use in South Asia and Southeast Asia. And it occurred to me today that perhaps the paucity of stone tools that you're discovering, uh, particularly as one moves towards the east, uh, you may be entering the realm of bamboo, which was thought to be, uh, we theorized at one point, to be a good explanation of why we don't have significant stone tool cultures in Southeast Asia. And I'm just wondering, as we think of uh, evolving ecologies, uh, perhaps even back uh, several hundred thousand years here in our context, uh, bamboo played a, a role that uh, we just don't appreciate. Uh, it's a different thought uh, and it's a, a little bit bizarre in some respects that, uh, you know, we've all worked with bamboo and you realize it's a fairly effective uh, medium to uh, accomplish quite a bit of work. Thank you. I'll, I'll follow up with the question uh, about the paleo geomorphology, uh, Parth. I'm just I'm just thinking about your your discussion about the importance of the uplift event, and I'm I'm curious. Uh, in your understanding of the paleo geography of the Shawala foothill areas, prior to that uplift event, how far away do you think the mountain front was? And in other words, I'm, I'm curious about the capacity of hominids to move across a landscape and, and find uh, stone tool resources. And, and prior to the uplift of the Shawala Hills, was it a great distance to the north before you got to the mountains? What is what is your understanding of that? Okay, uh, so to answer uh, Gary's question first, uh, about Southeast Asia, there's two issues about the bamboo hypothesis. Uh, one is that uh, based on experiments done recently by my colleagues, uh, even, even to use bamboo or exploit bamboo, one still needs stone tools to process the bamboo. So you would need stone tools, even simple ones, like choppers and flakes, to cut the bamboo, to shape it, to split it, uh, and then use it. So that's, there's a possibility that bamboo was being used more and more, and stone was being used less. 
but still stone tools are required uh, to process these materials. And the other thing is that about the geography, uh, uh, Southeast Asia, we have uh, one, the oldest site, uh, stone tool site is one million years old. And then we have uh, other sites which are about 700,000 years old and then going down to about 200,000 years old. So we have uh, sites in between, uh, sporadic uh, sites known, but I think the main reason for the absence of stone tools in Southeast Asia is a large part of the land mass is now submerged. I think that's the main reason why we're not finding so many stone tools. And of course, uh, it's very thickly vegetated. So to find sites is very difficult in such a landscape. Uh, but I think there's a combination of these things. Research bias, uh, landscape uh, variation, uh, the bamboo coming in as well. So there's a lot of different factors explaining the record for Southeast Asia. And now to answer the question about uh, what's happening in, in the Shivalix, uh, yes, before upliftment, I think it was very, just like today, the, the Ganga Plains, the situation was similar. So if they needed to go to the mountains and get raw material, uh, they could have easily. Uh, or they could have brought it with them from Central India as well, from the South. So it's not necessary that they always had to go to the north. north but Harth, I think we we lost your sound. Yes, we we, we yeah. lost. Can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Yeah. Okay. okay. So I was saying that it's not an issue of only raw material accessibility, but but the actually quality of raw material. Because I've noticed in the Bolo Kanama Formation, uh, I would say about eighty percent or seventy percent is dominated by uh, sandstone class. So that might not have been uh, suitable. Uh, so very little is quartzite. So even before upliftment, I'm wondering how much quartzite was available in the mountains for them to access. So it's questionable. They could have gone to the mountains, but I don't know if they would have actually tested that uh, possibility. So we, we have Dr. Milan Kumar Sharma. Uh, please yes. unmute yourself, Mike. Uh, 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 good morning, sir. Uh, first of all, I I'd like to congratulate for your wonderful lecture, sir. Uh, actually, sir, I just like to ask one question, sir. In many parts of the globe, sir, we are getting stone tools. Of, uh, for example, in the same time frame, we were getting the same uh, stone tools in India, then in Africa and Europe. We are getting in that uh, line also. So, do you think that the hominoids, uh, which are staying there in India, then Africa, then Eurasia, they start simultaneously using the stone tools, or whether some of the groups are starting using and then they are migrating and then they uh, uh, they dissipate how to use the stone tools? In your opinions, what do you think about this concept? Is is it because of the uh, 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 simultaneously the human IQ is increasing and then start using the stone tools in the same time frame. Right. Or just like that, some some group staying in the Africa or in Europe in Asia, uh, they start using and then they dissipated using the uh, these stone tools in different parts of the globe. Is it like that, or uh, what is your opinion in this regard, sir? Okay. Uh, hi, Milan. Nice to see you again. Uh, thank you. So that's a very good question. Uh, this actually is debated uh, today. Now, your question, it has a different answer for different technologies. Now, uh, theoretically, what we look at is we look at where the oldest evidence is. At the moment, the earliest technologies, if you look at older one and Ashulian, the oldest evidence is currently in Africa. And then we're getting some uh, t uh, younger assemblages elsewhere. So if we're going to get older assemblages in one location, we're going to assume that's the origin. But it does not necessarily mean that the younger evidence is a result of dispersal. It is possible that contemporary or younger evidence was a separate invention. Now, the problem is that this becomes difficult with uh, proving it uh, when it's simple technologies. If you have older one technology, uh, when population is very low, 
and fragmented. They were in North Africa, East Africa, uh, South Africa, in Europe, for example, around 1.5, 2 million years ago. Uh, if uh, a population in China invents a technology, older one technology, and then a population in Africa invents older one technology at the same time, or even uh, at different times, we cannot prove it. It's very difficult to prove that. So the possibility is there, but archaeologically, it's very difficult to prove that it was invented separately. Now, let's say that let's say that in the future, uh, between 2.6 million and 2.2 million uh, years ago, in between Africa and China, after many years of research, we find no evidence. Then we can say that maybe the 2.2 million year old evidence in China represents innovation rather than the dispersal from Africa. We do see multiple innovations after uh, 1 million across the world. But before 1 million, everything is coming, the oldest evidence is in Africa. Okay. So I think we don't have any other comments or. Okay, I'd like to, uh, I think it's, uh, we've had a wonderful opportunity to hear uh, this information. The The sound was a little bit choppy, but we, we got the, the information across and our uh, contribution to the seminar series. Uh, what yes. I'd like to do is uh, uh, suggest that we, it's it's conceivable just for, the, for us here thinking about it, that we, we might do a, a re-recording Parth, because the, the sound was choppy enough that it might be worthwhile uh, on a separate yeah. line to, to re-record yeah. your talk together with uh, the, the showing the images. So we'll talk about that uh, offline in, in sure. a lot of the communication. Yes. Sure. Uh, we, 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 we might, yeah, we might have actually the perfect recording. But we, we'll yes. just check it first, Bob. Hopefully, because, hopefully nice. Yeah, yeah, we'll just check it. Uh, 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 okay. we'll let you know. Uh, we, so we have a question. We have a question from Abhishek Fall. Uh, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Abhishek? So I'm not sure if, if Abshare can hear you. Mm. Ab, Abshare, if you have a question, please ask it. Uh, otherwise, we're going to be closing the session. So I'm, I'm afraid Abshare is, is not reaching us. So I, I'll just, uh, again, I'll, I'll bring the session to a close. And I want to remind everybody that we've got, uh, in a week's time, we're, we're going to have uh, the opportunity to hear Lisa Tykes, and, and following that, we'll have the opportunity to hear uh, Peter Zion. So I want to thank everybody for participating uh, this morning and this evening, wherever you are around the world, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again uh, in a week. Uh, so again, thank you all very much for thank you. Uh, participating. Yeah, goodbye. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye. Thank goodbye. Thank you very much. It was fun. Yeah. Part, thank you ever so much. Thank you. Sure. My pleasure.